This is chapter 12, the introduction to organic chemistry. And section three is about alkanes with substituents. The hydrogens in a hydrocarbon, such as a typical alkane, can be replaced by other atoms or groups of atoms called substituents. The two simplest types of substituents that we're gonna learn about in this section are the halogen atoms, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and alkyl groups, which are really just smaller hydrocarbon chains attached to the larger main chain. We're gonna learn how to write the IUPAC names for these kinds of structures, as well as draw their condensed structures and line angle formulas from the name. Halogen substituents are actually the easier part, so we're gonna save that for a little bit later. But one way to understand alkyl substituents is by understanding structural isomers. When two different molecules have the exact same atoms in them, but they're bonded together in a different pattern, the two molecules are said to be structural isomers of one another. So that means that structural isomers have the same molecular formula. If you write out their formulas in terms of just what element they have and how many, they'll be identical. But if you actually draw them out in terms of their structure, their bonding pattern, you'll see that they have a different arrangement of bonds. For instance, if you saw the molecular formula C4H10, you might be tempted to think that this is obviously a molecule of butane, the straight chain alkane that you see drawn here. This is a four carbon atoms in a row linked together with single bonds and then hydrogens added to them to finish the four bond requirement. You can see the condensed structural formula here and the line angle formula here. However, there's another molecule with the same formula C4H10, and that's this one down here. In this one, you have just three carbon atoms in a row, and then that central carbon has an additional carbon attached to it. This additional carbon, along with the hydrogens that it brings, is known as a substituent. You can see that the line angle formula here is much different from the one that you draw for butane above. So how do we draw the possible structural isomers for a molecule like pentane, C5H12? With butane, we just saw the only two possible structural isomers. For pentane, there are three. As the chains get longer and you have more carbons that you can rearrange into different shapes, the number of possible isomers grows pretty rapidly. So the best way to do a problem like this, which wants you to think about structural isomers, is to focus on the carbon chain itself. You can just draw five carbons in a row to indicate pentane, which would be the straight chain form of C5H12. We don't even really need to draw the hydrogens in yet because we're just looking at the different ways that we can connect these carbons together. The hydrogens aren't really gonna be important for that because they're always just gonna attach through single bonds to the outside. So if we take this straight chain and then we think about ways that we can rearrange it, one of the only things that we can do is take one of the carbons from the end and put it somewhere else. We can put it back at the beginning here, but then there would just be five carbons extended in the other direction and it would still be the same molecule really. So that's no good. We could put it back here, but that's the carbon it's already attached to, so that doesn't make sense. So that really leaves two options. We can either put it here or here. And in fact, we get the same answer either way. We would get four carbons in a row with an additional carbon attached to one of those two internal carbons. If I drew it as being attached to the other carbon here, it would just be the flip side of this molecule, this structure that I've drawn already. So here we now have two possible isomers of C5H12. I haven't added in the hydrogens yet because we can always save that for later. So the last thing that we have to do is find the last structure, the last isomer. If we start from this second structure, we can again take a carbon off the end and look at where we can attach it. We could attach it to this first carbon, but then it would just be back to the same molecule we started with because that carbon substituent would still be attached to one of the central two carbons. So that wouldn't be anything different. We can't attach it back to the same carbon that it came from because that wouldn't make any difference. And if we attach it here, we'll see that we actually just get a different conformation, but we still have a four carbon chain with a carbon substituent, which would now be this one attached to one of the central carbons. So that wouldn't make a different structure either. The only place that we can put this carbon to make a new structure is on this central carbon here. 
If we do that, we end up with a three carbon chain where the central carbon has two carbons attached to it. So these are the three basic structures of these uh, isomers of C5H12. To finish this up, the only thing that we have to do is really add in the hydrogens. And so it's good practice to do that, especially with these uh, somewhat new bonding patterns. So let's take a look. This first carbon has one bond to it, so it needs three hydrogens. So we would call that CH3. These middle three carbons in this would all be CH2. And this final carbon would again be CH3. You can add up all those hydrogens and you'll find that there's 12 of them. There's five carbons and so that makes this C5H12. In the second structure, these three carbons, this one, this one, and this one are all terminal carbons. So they all need three hydrogens. This carbon here needs two hydrogens because it has two bonds going to it. But this carbon here is now slightly new. It has three bonds going to it already. So it only needs one hydrogen to complete the four bond requirement. This is new. We didn't see any carbons in previous straight chain alkanes that needed only one hydrogen. In this case, it needs only one because its other bond is fulfilled by having this substituent, the CH3 group. In the last case, we have four terminal carbons, each of which needs a CH3. That gives us our 12 hydrogens. And in fact, if we look at the central carbon, it already has four bonds going to it, and so it doesn't need any hydrogens. So in each case, we have C5H12. So these are all three structural isomers of C5H12. So once again, the two main types of substituents are alkyl groups and the halo substituents or halogen atoms. The alkyl groups are just groups of carbon atoms, like little alkane chains themselves, and they're named according to the same IUPAC system. So an alkyl group with one carbon would be methyl, has the YL ending. Uh, a group with two carbons would be ethyl, three carbons would be propyl, and so on. For halogen substituents, the IUPAC system has them named just as fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iota. For both of these, the name of the substituent goes at the beginning of the compound name as a prefix, along with a number that indicates its position in the main carbon chain. We'll see some examples in a moment. These are the most common substituent groups, alkyl and halogen groups that you need to learn the names for. Uh, obviously, you have the halogens down here, which are pretty simple. You're just taking the first syllable of the halogen name and then adding O to that and that becomes the prefix, fluoro, chloro, bromo, iodo. For the others, you're just taking the name of the alkane, and instead of ending it with A-N-E, you're adding the Y-L ending. So methyl is one carbon, ethyl is two carbons, propyl is three, uh, butyl is four. Now there are some differences here. For instance, there's propyl and then there's isopropyl. The difference here is in where this three carbon chain attaches to the main compound. If the propyl group attaches through one of its own end carbons, like this, at this point, then it's a regular propyl group. If it attaches through the middle carbon, like this, then it's an isopropyl group. We'll see some examples of both in a moment. For butane, or for a butyl group, I should say, there's several different places that it can attach or arrangements that it can take. And so we have not just butyl, but isobutyl, secbutyl, and tertbutyl. Those different butyl arrangements are not really that necessary to remember for this course. We're not going to run into them that much. But these you should definitely remember, as well as the halogens and most likely the regular butyl substituent. So how do we put all these rules together to come up with a unique name for a compound like the one you see here? Well, we have to begin by naming it as an alkane and then add prefixes for any other substituents and things that we see. So we have to begin by finding the longest carbon chain in the molecule, and that's gonna tell us the alkane name. In a lot of cases, in homework or in exams, they're relatively artificial, and so you'll see a chain of carbons right in the middle that makes sense and is the, the longest carbon chain. In this case, it's five carbons. We know that the prefix for five carbons is pent, and we also see that there's only single bonds between them, which makes this an alkane, 
and so we would call it pentane. Now, if everything attached to these carbons were hydrogen, then we would be done. But we can see here that we have a chlorine here and a CH3 group here. So we have to name these as substituents and put them at the beginning of the name of this. The Cl chlorine group is gonna be called chloro, and the CH3 is really a one carbon alkyl chain, one carbon, the prefix is meth, and so as, an, uh, as a substituent, we call this methyl. But that's not quite enough because this chloro group and this methyl group can really attach anywhere to a pentane that there's a hydrogen. So how do we distinguish this specific molecule from another one where the chlorine maybe is here in place of this hydrogen or something like that? Well, we do that by using a numbering system. We have to number the main carbon chain from the end closest to a substituent. In this case, the chlorine group is closest to this end, so we would begin numbering with this carbon. That would make this carbon number one, this carbon number two, this carbon number three, this number four, and this number five. Now notice in this case, we counted from left to right, but that's not always the case. I only started this carbon because it was closest to a substituent to this chloro group. If there were a substituent at the other end, say here, then I would have to start counting at that one because it would be closer to that substituent. Now that we have our numbering system though, it's pretty easy to finish the prefix names for these substituents. This chlorine group is on carbon number two, and so it's gonna be called 2-chloro. This methyl group is on carbon number three, and so it's gonna be called 3-methyl. After that, you just have to put these substituent names as prefixes to pentane in alphabetical order. Regardless of the numbers, chloro C comes before methyl M. And so this is gonna be called 2-chloro-3-methyl pentane. Notice that you always put a dash between a number and a letter, like here, here, and here. With cycloalkanes, the naming system is a little bit different. What you have to remember is that the IUPAC name is designed to allow a unique name for any molecule that you can think of. That means that you only need to add numbers in to the prefixes of the substituents if you need to specify where those substituents are. In a cyclic alkane with only one substituent, all of the carbons that it could attach to are exactly the same. So there's no reason to specify one over the other. So if you have a cyclic alkane with only one substituent, you don't need a number to indicate the placement of that substituent. In other words, here we can see an ethyl group, two carbon chain attached to a carbon in a six membered ring. The six membered ring, the hexagon is representative of cyclohexane and the two carbon substituent is the ethyl group. But if we attach the two carbon substituent here, it wouldn't really be any different. It would just be a rotation of the original molecule. And so we don't need to specify a number for the substituent. We can just call it ethyl cyclohexane. So let's do a few examples where we take names and convert them into formulas and formulas and convert them into names. We'll also see some new examples here that have some stuff that we haven't really covered yet, but we'll explain it as we go. The first example says to draw the condensed structural and line angle formulas for 2,3-dimethylbutane. So in order to start this problem, we have to be able to take apart this name and extract the relevant information. So first you look for the main compound name. In this case, it's butane, right? You know the A-N-E ending means it's an alkane with only single bonds between carbon atoms. And the but prefix means it's four carbons. So we start by drawing four carbons single bonded together. There's no cyclo in front, so we know that we don't have to put it into a ring shape. We can just draw a straight line. Then we have to take a look at the prefix. We haven't quite seen this before where we have a di uh, addition to the prefix. We know that a methyl group is just a CH3, but when you have di in front of any substituent name, that means you have two of them. And that's why there are two numbers here separated by commas. 
2 comma 3 dash dimethyl means that you have one methyl group on the 2 carbon and one methyl group on the 3 carbon. Since I'm drawing this structure, I'm free to choose the numbering system for the carbon chain that I've drawn. Usually I just number them from left to right because it's easier for me that way. So this would be carbon 1, this would be carbon 2, this would be 3, and this would be 4. That means that one of the methyl groups being on carbon 2 is here, and one of them being on carbon 3 is here. In this case, I drew one up and one down just because it fit the room that I had, but it's not really necessary to do it one way or another. They could both be up or both be down, or the other one could be up and the other one could be down. It doesn't really matter. Remember that these structures can rotate and shift into different conformations. So now that I've covered everything that's indicated by prefixes in the name, I've extracted all the information that I can from the name, and so the last thing to do is to just check my structure and make sure that all of my carbons have the right number of bonds. Obviously, this first carbon here needs three bonds to give it four. This second carbon has three bonds already, so it only needs one more hydrogen, and the same goes for this carbon. And then this carbon at the end also needs three hydrogens to form its four bond requirement. So this is the condensed structural formula for 2,3-dimethylbutane. How would we draw this in the line angle formula? Well, it's actually quite a bit easier once you get used to it. The first thing you have to do is once again just draw butane. And so you draw a zigzag representing four carbons. One, two, three, four. Then you need a numbering system again. So I'll start here and say this first carbon is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. And then you just have to add a methyl group to the second carbon, this one, and the third carbon, this one. In the case of line angle formulas, a methyl group is really just a line coming off of the main structure. That's because every time you have a line terminate in a line angle formula, it implies that there's a carbon there, which then must have three hydrogens attached to it. So you don't need to write the CH3 at the end of this. Just leaving the line open at the end expresses that. So this is the methyl group on the two carbon, and then this would be the methyl group on the three carbon. And then since this is a line angle formula and you don't need to draw out the hydrogens, at this point you're done. You can go ahead and erase your numbering system so it doesn't mess it up or crowd the space, and you have your line angle formula for 2,3-dimethylbutane. Again, one of these methyl groups was drawn up and one of them was drawn down because of sort of the flow of the zigzag of this structure. But it wouldn't really be wrong to draw this methyl group also pointing down, or maybe this one pointing up and that one pointing down. It looks a little bit weird, and it's not something that you see that often, but it wouldn't be marked incorrect. This example says to draw the condensed structural and line angle formulas for 3-bromo-1-chlorobutane. So here we again have a butane base, so a 4-carbon chain, with a 3-bromo and a 1-chloro substituent. Again, I would start numbering from the left, 1, 2, 3, 4. That means that the bromine is going to be on this carbon, carbon number 3, and the chlorine is going to be on this carbon, carbon number 1. You can see, again, I've chosen to draw both of these in the upward direction, but it's not necessary to do that. You could even put this chlorine on the same line as the carbon chain. However, I would avoid doing that because then it's easy to confuse that chlorine for another carbon. But that's a personal preference. Now that you have your 3-bromo and your 1-chloro substituents covered, you're done with the name and you can just fill in the hydrogens. This first carbon has two bonds going to it, so it only needs two more to get four. This second carbon needs two. This carbon here has three bonds going to it, so it only needs one carbon to be satisfied. And this carbon at the end needs the usual three. So this would be the condensed structural formula for 3-bromo-1-chlorobutane. To draw the line angle formula, we would again start from the zigzag for butane, one, two, three, four, and then we could draw a chlorine on the first carbon and a bromine on the third carbon. Now, keep in mind that when you draw a chlorine out like this, or any atom out like this, it can sometimes look like you actually have five carbons, one, two, three, four, Five. You have to remember that this chlorine being here means that there's no carbon at this end. This is just a chlorine atom. And so you can only count four 
of the corners in that zigzag as carbon atoms. Now let's look at naming a structure that we're given. So remember that the first thing you have to always do is find the longest carbon chain in the structure. That means finding one of the terminal carbons and then counting as many carbons as you can get to, until you reach another terminal carbon. We can start at this left one and say that this is carbon number one, this is carbon number two, this is number three, this would be number four, this would be number five, and we might be tempted to say that this then is number six and that this is a hexane compound. But in fact, if you don't go with that carbon is number six and you instead say that this carbon is number six, then you have another path that you can get to this carbon and make that number seven. That means that the longest unbroken continuous carbon chain in this molecule is actually seven carbons long. It's this pathway. So remember, just because a molecule is drawn a certain way or, or is laid out a certain way, don't be confused into thinking that this is the chain that you need to be paying attention to. In this case, the actual chain bends down and this portion here is actually a substituent. This chlorine, of course, is also a substituent. And so now we need to think about naming this, which means we have to figure out the number for this chloro substituent and for this methyl substituent. Remember that anytime you have a line terminating, it really means that there's a CH3 there, which is a methyl group. So it looks like we have the chloro in number four and the methyl in carbon number five. However, I just randomly started counting this from the left-hand side of the molecule. Now that I know my carbon chain, I have to think more about whether I counted from the right end. In this case, if I start counting from the end that I have labeled carbon seven now, then this methyl group would end up being on carbon three. In other words, this methyl group is closer to this end than this chloro group is to this end. So the end of this seven carbon chain that's closest to a substituent is this one which means that that should really be my carbon number one. And now I have to go back and renumber the rest of the carbons, taking that into account. This is one, that makes this two, this would be three, this is still four, this is five, this is six, and this is seven. Now that we know that we have the correct numbering system, we can go ahead and name this. The prefixes are gonna be four chloro and three methyl because the methyl group is attached to the carbon three now, and the chloro is still on carbon four. Even though three is less than four, we still put four chloro first in the prefixes because it's alphabetical. Chloro is before methyl alphabetically. So we start with four dash chloro. Remember, it always put a dash between a number and a letter. Then we wanna add in the three methyl. So we need another dash, three dash methyl. And then we now have finished all the substituents, the prefixes for the substituents, and we just put the name of the alkane. Since it's seven carbons long, this one is heptane. So this molecule is four chloro, three methyl heptane. Here's a couple of other examples. In this one, we have one, two, three, four, carbons. Remember not to count this as a carbon. It's a bromine atom there, so it's not coincident with a carbon or covering a carbon. It's just there instead of a carbon. So we only have four carbons in this chain, which makes this a kind of butane. But we do have a bromo here, and so we need to add the bromo prefix. The only thing is we need a number. Again, it looks obvious at first that this would be four bromobutane, but in fact, Knowing that this bromo is a substituent means we should count starting at this carbon. And so this has to be carbon number one, and we have to reverse everything else. That means instead of being four bromobutane, this is actually one bromobutane. Remember to always start counting at the end closest to a substituent. In this case, it's the end that has a substituent right on it. In this example, we again want to find the longest carbon chain down here for B. So we could start left to right, say one, two. Obviously we don't want to go with three up here because that would be too short and we would end there and have we have so many more carbons we could count. So we would go here for carbon three, here for carbon four, 
And then again, we have a choice whether this is carbon five or this is carbon five. Obviously, going up allows us to get to another carbon, carbon six, so we would pick that choice and say that that is the longest carbon chain. That's a six carbon chain, so this is going to be a hexane derivative. Hex means six. We have this and this, which are both substituents. Remember, anytime a line terminates in a line angle formula, it's really a CH3 group. It's really a methyl group. So is this methyl group on two and this one on four, or do we have to renumber our system? Well, we can see this methyl group is basically right next to this end, uh, whereas this methyl group is two carbons away from this end. So we did start numbering at the right carbon in this case. That first methyl group is closer to this end than the other one is to the other end. That means our numbering system is right, and we can take our two methyls and say they're at the two carbon and the four carbon. Now remember, when we have two of the same substituent, we can combine them together, and instead of saying methyl, methyl, or something like that, we can say dimethyl. However, even when we say dimethyl, we need to include numbers for both of them. So the numbers would be two and four, making this two comma four dash dimethyl, and then the name of the compound is hexane. So 2,4-dimethylhexane is the name of this organic compound. 